All right, good afternoon. Can you please state and spell for us your full name? First name is John, J-O-H-N. Middle name Joseph, J-O-S-E-P-H. Last name Picaretta, P-I-C-C-A-R-R-E-T-A. -E okay, Mr. Picaretta. Is that correct. correct? Okay. Mr. Picaretta, have you ever had your deposition taken before? Uh, in a civil matter, no. In any kind of matter? Uh, no. Okay, have you ever testified in a case before? A civil case? Well, let's start with a civil case. No. Have you ever testified in a criminal case? Yes. Okay, in what context? Um, I'm a retired police officer and had to testify in some criminal proceedings. Okay, how many times? Good question. Um, again, this would be an estimate. I can't say for sure. I'm going off my head maybe 10 to 20 times. When did you retire from the uh, police department? Uh, 2006. Which police department did you last serve in? In Glendale, Arizona. How long were you serving at the police department in Glendale? Just over 20 years. So back to like 1986 or so? Yeah, 86 to 2006, approximately. Where do you currently work? Who's your current employer? Arizona Department of Child Safety. How long have you worked with the Arizona Department of Child Safety? Since December of 2014. What did you do in between 2006 and December of 2014? I worked for the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. In what capacity? Uh, I conducted employee misconduct investigations. Under what department? It was the investigations division of uh, Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. I'm sorry, can you say Investigations that? division. Is that part of human resources? Is the, no, what is that? No, it was separate from human resources. Is that sort of like internal affairs or something? Correct. Okay. Does DCS have a similar unit, like an internal affairs? No. How does DCS go about investigating allegations of employee misconduct? Um, once they're brought to the attention of human resources, it's assigned to um, either myself and my current title's employee relations officer or one of the other employee relations officers. When you first started with DCS in December 2014, what was your position? I was a senior investigator. In what unit? At that time, they did have an office of special investigations. Okay, and that would be equivalent to like an internal affairs department? Correct. At what point in time did that change? You said at that time they yeah, did have it. It changed approximately February, March of 2015. And in February, March, time frame of 2015, what unit did you go to? The human resources. So explain to me, was this um, the investigations unit, was that sort of subsumed into the human resources or was it disbanded? And then it was disbanded and um, I was offered a position as a human re employee relations officer. Okay. What does a employee relations officer do? Um, part of it help provides guidance to um, supervisors as to um, you know employee issues. Um, it also conducts uh, investigations um, on employee misconduct issues, as, as well as fills out various documents, paperwork for the disciplinary process. Does the or does an employee relations officer make recommendations for discipline? Um, yeah, it's recommendations is, yes, does make recommendations for. You don't, you don't actually have the authority to uh, meet out discipline yourself. No. You would make recommendations to some other uh, body or unit for discipline. Correct. Okay. Where would those recommendations go? Um, it would go to, you know, the program administrator of that region, as well as it's reviewed by um, the deputy uh, director of that division, as well as depending on the severity of the discipline, the director of the agency would also sign off on it. Okay, so let me make sure I understand the process correctly first, is if some sort of misconduct comes to the attention of the Human Resources Department, somebody like yourself would be assigned to investigate those allegations of misconduct. And then if it turns out through the investigation that, yeah, something happened there, you might recommend discipline, right? Correct. And there would be some sort of writing or written recommendation that's transmitted to 
both the program administrator and the deputy director of that particular region? Um, yes. Okay. And then the program administrator and the deputy director, what is their role? Do, do they have the ability to decide whether or not they are in fact going to follow your recommendations? Correct. They could, for example, just say, oh no, you're soaking wet. We're not going to follow your recommendations. Well, there's a discussion in that process what would be the most appropriate. Um, okay. And then, you know, if it, basically the recommendation is guidance toward them and this based on certain factors such as past discipline or the severity of the issue recommendation. And then it's discussed with the program administrator and deputy director. And then they can follow our recommendation mm -hmm. or they um, potentially could decide something different if they so choose. Okay. And is that process, that communicative process that you just described for me, is that somewhere uh, reduced to writing? Is there a report? Are there memos that go back and forth? How does that conversation happen? Um, currently, there is a meeting every Tuesday, like an employee relations meeting, to discuss various um, employment issues, part of which could be employment misconduct. Mm -hmm. And then there's a verbal discussion to determine um, what uh, discipline, if any, is appropriate for the action of the employee. Okay. Now, you under and you've been doing that current position since the changeover in February or March 2015, correct? Correct. Okay, and that's still what you do today? Yes. Okay. If you can take a look at exhibit number A there, and it's a document titled, I should know this by heart by now, Notice of Deposition of AIDS Person Most Knowledgeable and Request for Production of Documents. You see that? Yes. Okay, and have you seen that document some point uh, before today? Uh, this full document, no. Um, okay, have you ever seen a document like that, that, either that document or one similar to it, at any point before today? The only, I saw a portion of this document, categories um, that I would be speaking about or ask questions about, okay. which is 20 to, which would have been page 9 and 10. Okay, and that would include uh, category numbers 21 through 27 and perhaps some portion of categories number 28 and 29, is that right? Correct. Are there any other categories as to which you have been designated to testify today? No. And you understand, don't you, that you are, you've been identified and designated by the agency to testify here today as the person most knowledgeable um, on behalf of the agency, as the voice of the agency with respect to those categories numbered 21 through 27 and parts of 28 and 29? Yes. Okay. And do you feel comfortable that you've been adequately prepared to testify on behalf of the agency as the voice of the agency with respect to those categories? Yes. What steps, if any, did you take to prepare yourself to testify as the person most knowledgeable here today? Um, again, I reviewed what uh, the categories which I may be testifying about. Um, I spoke with Mr. Bowen also as to what these categories are referring to and um, what my testimony may entail this, uh, this afternoon. Okay. Did, aside from conversations with Mr. Bowen, did you undertake any independent effort at all to prepare yourself to testify here today as the person most knowledgeable for the agency? Uh, no. Okay. Did you review any documents in an effort to make yourself um, comfortable that you were able to testify as the person most knowledgeable on behalf of the agency here today? No other documents, no. Okay. You understand that the agency has a pretty substantial body of policies and procedures that are in place, correct? There are, yes, there are policies and procedures. And there's a pretty substantial body of training that the workers for the agency are provided that relate to those policies and procedures, correct? Yes, there is training for them. Okay. And you also understand that there is some measure of training that is provided 
to workers for the agency relative to the federal laws that apply to the work that they do, correct? That I can't speak to. I know there are trainings. Mm -hmm. I haven't attended those trainings that workers actually go through. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak exactly what courses or lesson plans they are receiving. Well, listen, you spent 20 years as a police officer, correct? Yes. In the course of that 20 years, you went yourself, you went through post training, correct? Correct. And then did you have some refresher training over the years relative to some of the legal issues that yes. apply to? You, you got to wait. Oh, wait till he's done. <laughs> yeah, you got to wait. Sometimes my questions kind of ramble on. I know I get a little impatient, uh, but you got to wait till they're out. Otherwise, it's not, you know, complete and clear. But uh, yeah, over your 20 years with the police department, you had refresher trainings about the laws that um, affected the work that you were doing as a police officer. Correct. Correct. And then you also had on-the-job training, mentoring, things like that as well, correct? Correct. And some of the subject matter that you covered when you were a police officer for about 20 years included um, the constitutional rights that citizens have under, for example, the First, the Fourth, the Fourteenth Amendments, correct? As a police officer, yes. Yeah. And that included the Fourth Amendment right to be free of unreasonable government searches and seizures, correct? As a police officer, correct. Okay. Did you learn anything with respect to warrant requirements as a police officer? As a police officer, yes. Okay. What did you learn about the purpose of warrants, the purpose that a warrant serves in the context of the work you were doing as a police officer? Well, again, you have to uh, show there's um, probable cause to, to get the warrant. There was an affidavit to show that there's reason, reason to believe there's evidence of that crime inside the residence. Okay. Or vehicle or whatever. Right, that would be for a search warrant. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there, there are certain exceptions to that, though, right? There's certain circumstances, yes. Like exigent Exigence circumstances. Cir correct. Okay. And what was the understanding that you developed when you were a police officer about the legal definition of exigent circumstances? Well, if there was immediate danger to subject, immediate. Um, uh, maybe evidence that could be destroyed immediately with prior to being able to acquire mm -hmm. you know, a search warrant. Okay, so let's focus for a moment on this, this concept of immediate danger. Um, when we're talking about that time element, the immediacy, what are we talking about there? Are we talking about months, weeks, days, hours, minutes? Uh, as a police officer, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, immediate within, immediate could be you know, seconds, minutes, things such a short period of time that either the someone could potentially be injured or evidence destroyed. Sort sort of like the axe is falling, and if you don't do something right now, somebody's going to get hurt. Correct. Okay. And in instances where the danger, and this is again just focusing on that immediate danger uh, element for exigency where the danger is not like an ax is falling, we have to act right now, you have a little bit of time. What is it you're supposed to do then? No, I'm speaking as a police officer sure, now, sure. not anything else. Sure. Um, if you have time, you, you keep the house under surveillance, you acquire, you write the affidavit for the search warrant, have the judge review it, sign it, search warrant, and then serve the search warrant to recover the evidence or whatever you're looking to find. Right, or if that, that's if we're looking at a, a search issue. If we're looking at a, like a protective issue where we're looking to a, avert or avoid a danger, you would go through the same process if it's not immediate, right? You would go to a judge, lay out an affidavit, request a, either a protective custody order or some sort of protective warrant from the judge, and then execute it, right? Speaking as a police officer. Right. right. Yes, if there's time, you have the ability to do that. Okay. And when we say if there's time, in your practice, in those 20 years that you were a police officer, let me ask this first. How many times do you recall having um, actually sought a warrant? How many times I've you, sought a warrant? Yeah. Uh, based on my capacities that I serve, it could be, if not over 100 within that. 
in that range. In range, yes. Okay. And out of those roughly, you know, plus or minus, but 100 uh, times that you sought a warrant of some type, on average, how long did it take to actually obtain the warrant that you were seeking? Uh, again, it could take several hours. Four or five, on average? Well, I, I say closer to two to three. Two to three? Four to five. Okay. So on average, out of those 100 warrants, that, 100 plus or minus, I know that's not a solid number. It's yes. just in that range. But on those 100 plus or minus warrants that you sought, on average, it would take somewhere between two or three hours to obtain that warrant? Correct. Okay, and then you would execute the warrant? Execute the warrant. Okay. Now, were judges on call available for you to seek warrants 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Um, yes. Okay, and you could actually call in by telephone, uh, depending on the circumstances, to get approval and then follow it up with your affidavit later, correct? Correct. Okay. When you had those instances, and, and did you do that when you were a police officer in those 20 years? Did you have occasion to seek a court authorization to do a search or seizure by telephone? Um, yes, I did. Okay. Roughly, how many times have you done that? Again, thinking back, it was over 10 years ago. Sure, no, I, I there know. And before that, I'll say about a dozen times. Okay. And when you're able to do it by telephone, uh, on average, in those dozen or so times, about how long did it take to obtain that uh, judge authorization, that warrant? Um, again, depending on availability of judge, because they had other duties during those times, it takes two, three hours. Okay, so it's Sometimes about the same. shorter, yeah. So it's about the same. H have you ever been called out on a uh, domestic violence call? Yeah, as a police officer, yes. Okay. And when you're called out on a domestic violence call, sometimes were you ever, you know, faced with the circumstance where you thought you might need to get a protective order for, you know, one of the people involved in that? In order of protection, you're speaking. Yeah, an order of protection, sure. Um, we wouldn't get it for them. We'd direct uh, the individual where to go. Okay, so that's not something that you would call in and obtain? No, an order of protection for them, no. Okay. Have you ever sought a temporary protective order for a person? As far as a, uh, define temporary protective order. Well, something where you obtain uh, authorization from a court or a judge to order a person to stay away from another place or another person. Okay. Um, no, I have not obtained a temporary protective order signed by the judge for an individual. Okay. I've never had to do that. What you, you have done, though, is obtain warrants to either seize persons or search property or I persons. I have, as a police officer. Just wait up before you're even done. As a police officer, I've obtained search warrants. Okay. Do you have any understanding? Um, well, let me ask it this way. In your training as a police officer, were you guys trained at all relative to Ninth Circuit law that applied to the work that you were doing as a police officer? I can't specifically speak to Ninth, you know, as far as the decision came from the Ninth Circuit. I can't, at this point, years ago, I can't speak okay. to that. Fair enough. Did you receive any training as a police officer that, um, actually let me back up a little bit. When you were a police officer, did you ever have occasion um, to go out on a call where there was some suspected or alleged child abuse? Um, yes. Okay. How frequently did that happen? Just, you know, year over year on average. Um, as the initial responder, our first responder, I wish I could say a number, but I'm sure it's within the 40s, 50s, 60s. So it was something that happened fairly, I wouldn't say frequently, but something that happened consistently throughout your career? Um, yes. Okay. And since it's something that happened consistently throughout your career, I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you had training about how to deal with those situations where you were going out and investigating allegations of child abuse, correct? Yes, it was a protocol. 
Okay, there's a protocol. Was there also some, uh, was there some element to your post-training that dealt with that circumstance? Um, again, I, I left over 10 years ago. I, I can't specifically say a certain course in post, a post-certified mm -hmm. course. Um, but, I mean, I can simply say that we had training in the, in the response okay. you know, of certain situations. Sure. And did you have training as a police officer um, relative to the rights that run between parents and children in the context of a police investigation of child abuse allegations? Well, yes, we had training as far as what the procedure would be in the event um, there was an allegation or evidence of child abuse. Okay, and along with that training regarding the procedure, you also had training that touched on the rights of the children and the parents in the context of your investigation, correct? Uh, yes, as a police officer. Okay, as a police officer. Did that include training about the application of the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment warrant requirements that inure to the benefit of children and parents? Um, I, w I wouldn't say it's Fourth Amendment trained in specifically in reference to child abuse. Mm -hmm. It's in general, here's the rights, here's the Fourth Amendment, what states, what you need to get a warrant or, or to enter a, a residence or things such as that. Okay. Well, I guess I'm more specific than that. In the context of a child abuse investigation, when you go out, there's a potential that you're going to either yourself seize the child from the situation that may be dangerous or assist somebody else, perhaps a DCS agent, in seizing the child from that situation if it turns out it's a dangerous situation, right? Correct. Okay. So in that context where you know you may go out and seize a child, did you get uh, training from the police department or anywhere else? that sort of gave you an understanding of what your powers were and what the rights of the parents and children were in that context? Yes. Okay. Am I correct that according to the training that you received as a police officer now, that first of all, it is presumptively unlawful to remove a child from the custody of its parents without first getting a warrant? Were you trained that? No. Were you trained that you may not remove a child from the custody of its parents unless at the time of the removal you have specific articulable evidence to show that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it takes to get a warrant and there is no other lesser intrusive alternative means of protecting the child? Did you learn something like that? What we learned if the child is um, potentially under, uh, I should say, subject to abuse or neglect, okay? Not necessarily is your example, but. Okay, if the child is subject to abuse or neglect, then what? I'm talking as a police officer. Yes, I can't speak for, any, you know, for any other organization at that time. Right, that, all we're talking about right now is what you learned and understood what, 10 years ago as a police officer for Glendale? And okay. we're not talking about right now today. You understand okay. that? Yes? Okay. <coughs> we would either, um, we could take that child in the lack of a better term, protective custody after serving a temporary custody notice to the, par temporary cust custody notice to the parent. Mm -hmm. Again, this is 10 years ago. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, and or facilitate um, the removal of the child, uh, basically assisting at the time child protective services. Am I correct though that when we're looking at removing the child from that home, from the parent's custody, you could not do it, according to your training as a police officer, you could not do it without a warrant unless at the time of the removal you had specific articulable evidence to show that the child was likely to suffer severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take you to obtain a warrant. 
Okay. As a police officer, we would not participate in getting a warrant to remove the child. Mm -hmm. As a police officer, that's a different, uh, a different function that CPS at the time, Child Protective Services, would facilitate okay. the removal of the child. Okay, let, let me try again because I'm really not concerned okay. about DCS or okay. DES or whatever they were called back then. Um, what I'm concerned about is the, your training as a police officer that you had about the limitations that were placed on the exercise of your power and authority regarding removing children from the custody of their parents. So just police. Are you with me? Yes, now I am. Okay. So as a police officer, according to your training, am I correct that as a police officer you did not have authority, legal authority, to remove a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant unless you had evidence at the time of the removal that the child was in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it would take to get a warrant. Am I correct? No, in the training in Arizona, there would have to be some indications of abuse or neglect. It could be a bruise on the child, it could be um, some type of evidence of some type of abuse. Not necessarily immediate death. Um, what about immediate bodily injury? Um, we could remove them if there's evidence of bodily injury. So if it's already happened? If it's already happened, okay. and we, as a police officer, notice injuries on the child, and there's also totality of circumstances. Sure. It's not just a bruise, there's all Sears investigation going on. Sure. Uh, we could, as for the basis of investigation, take temporary, temporary custody of that child, either by serving a TCN, or, or with the assistance of then Child Protective Services, um, uh, facilitate the removal based on their procedures and policies at that time. Okay, so just so that I'm clear, according to the training that you had and the policies of the city of Glendale that were in place back between 1986 and 2006, as a police officer, you did have the authority to remove a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant even if there was no immediate danger to the child. Correct. Do you know whether or not your police department had ever been sued for removing a child from the custody of its parents without first getting a warrant under circumstances where there was no immediate danger? I'm not aware of it. No. Okay. And currently, well, are you familiar at all in your capacity today of the laws, including the Fourth, First, and Fourteenth Amendments, that might apply to restrict the power of the workers for your agency? Uh, no, my, like I say, my position as of today mm -hmm. is just to investigate policy violations. Okay. Am I correct that as a matter of training and policy, DCS workers are required to guarantee due process and the basic civil rights of parents and children? Um, Again, I'm not involved in the training of their workers, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not familiar with with that training manual that you refer to. Hey, let, let me ask this way. Would a worker, particularly an investigations worker, be subject to discipline if they, through, the, through their work with a particular family, violated a parent or child's constitutional rights? Um, again, if we'd have to look, if they, in my capacity, mm -hmm. um, at policy and procedure, I look at the, the circumstances as it relates to policy and procedure. Well, if you take a look at exhibit number A, category number 21, for which you've been designated to testify as the person most knowledgeable on the part of your agency, it reads, the Arizona Department of Economic Security's Disciplinary Measures, Enforcement, Mechanism, Methods, Procedures, and or Proceedings 
when a social worker deprives and or violates a parent and or child's constitutional rights. First, did I read that correctly? Yes, that's what it says. And when you were first presented with this document in that meeting with Mr. Bowen, your attorney, did you read that at category number 21? I read that, yes. And did you understand what you read there? I understand okay. what that says, yes. Are you or are you not the person most knowledgeable? And just to preface this, it's perfectly fine if you're not the guy I need to be talking to about this. We'll get somebody else. It's not a major okay. crisis. Are you or are you not competent to testify here today or knowledgeable, let me put it that way, knowledgeable enough to testify here today on behalf of your agency regarding the disciplinary measures, enforcement mechanisms, methods, procedures, and or proceedings when a social worker deprives and or violates a parent and or child's constitutional rights? Um, and maybe I'm misconstruing this. Um, I'm just saying is my role is to investigate um, what current policies and procedures are in place and if if a worker violated those procedures. Um, I don't necessarily determine um, the constitutionality of the procedures or or what they do. I just determine it if the employee through investigation possibly violated a policy or procedure that's currently in place. Um, well, let me ask this way. You would agree with me, wouldn't you, that any government agent, whether it's law enforcement, the IRS, INS, DCS, whoever, any government agency, they are restrained and restricted in their authority by the Constitution, correct? That's the United States Constitution. Yes. Um, again, I don't formulate policy or procedure, um, and I don't want to assume anything. Um, however, um, when the policy is formulated or created, um, again, it's an assumption and probably reality. It's reviewed by various uh, disciplines, the lawyer that makes sure it falls into um, uh, um, that it follows anything. Okay, um, and then once I just take the procedure policy as it is and determine whether or not a worker uh, violate that procedure. Okay. Are, so, you, are you able to testify here today as the voice of your agency as to what sorts of discipline would be meted out on a worker who violated a parent or child's constitutional rights? If you're not, that's fine. Just tell me. You know, it's, I don't no, I would say no as far as they violate constitutional rights. Okay. okay, it wouldn't be part of my investigation. It would be if policy procedure was violated. Okay, so am I correct then that you are not the person most knowledgeable, qualified to testify today as to category number 21? I would say no, I don't determine that. So you're not, you're not the correct person to be answering my questions with respect no. to category number 21 today, correct? As respect to category 21, I would say no as far as the constitutionality of the procedures or policies. Okay. And even based on your training and experience that you, or even relying on your training and experience that you had as a, a police officer of 20, of 20 years, you still don't feel comfortable talking about that, correct? Um, as it relates to our agency, no, I, I can, I can testify what I did as a police officer, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago and before that. Um, um, but again, I can, I feel comfortable testifying on the investigation of our policy and procedures as they are right now and talk to you on the disciplinary process. Okay. Um, but as far as determining, I do not determine the constitutionality of anyone's act. Well, let me ask it this way. First, before we get into it, is it your understanding that somehow 
the law as it applies to restrict the authority and power of police officers is different in some way than the law that applies to restrict the power and authority of DCS investigators, for example? Or is the law the same? Let's say so. the law applies to everybody. Okay. Um, it's my understanding here. I would my test. I would testify as our to a disciplinary procedure. What would happen? Employee misconduct. Okay. I can explain to you how we look at whether employee invest uh, violated policy, current policy or procedure. Okay. Um, I don't necessarily look into the if the act was constitutional or not I just look into if what happened was within policy and procedure let me ask it this way is a DCS employee subject to discipline if they violate a parent or child's constitutional right rights They're subject to discipline if they violate policy and procedure. Okay. So looking again at category number 21, mm -hmm. do you see the words policy or procedure anywhere in there? Meth procedures. You, okay. Procedures, disciplinary measures, disciplinary procedures mm -hmm. when a social worker deprives or violates a parent or child's constitutional rights. So that's what we're looking for. What are the disciplinary measures, disciplinary methods, disciplinary mechanisms or procedures that will apply to a worker who deprives a parent or violates a parent and or child's constitutional rights? What are the procedures that will apply to discipline that person? Um. Procedure is if there is a question um, or an allegation or a complaint as to the conduct um, or actions of an employee, okay? Um, myself or another employee relations officers would look at the totality of circumstances of the action. And then once uh, we look at it um, and it's determined if a current DCS policy had been violated. Um, the disciplinary um, procedure would be entailed. It would, uh, a, uh, maybe a fact-finding report would be completed or a disciplinary worksheet, pretty similar in nature, um, which would summarize the activities of the, uh, of the employee or the action of the employee and any policies the employee may have violated. Okay. Have you ever, in your entire time with the agency, been called upon to investigate a worker for allegations that they seized a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant? Is that, I, first, I, let me ask, has that complaint ever come to your desk? To my desk, no. To any the, desk that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So you've never investigated a social worker or a investigator or one of your workers for seizing a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant? I have not, no. Have you ever investigated a worker for allegations that they seized a child from the custody of their parent when there was no legitimate basis to do so? Um, I personally have not, no. But you've heard of that? I can't say I've heard of it. I just say I haven't. Um, I, I cannot say honestly I've heard of that. Okay. Have you undertaken any effort in preparing yourself to come here and testify today as the person most knowledgeable for the agency regarding investigations or complaints that have been made by parents or others about having their children seized when they believe there was no legitimate basis to seize the kids? No, I've not looked to see if there's any 
Okay. So, so you've done Specific nothing. Specific reports as what you just described. No. Okay, so you've done nothing to prepare yourself to answer those sorts of questions no, here today. No, as far as, as far as you're talking about investigations on the circumstances you just described. Right. No, I have not. Okay, okay so you're, you're not able to testify as category number one, let's, or 21, uh, right? Correct. Okay, so we'll go on to category number 22. It says the Arizona Department of Economic Securities disciplinary measures, enforcement mechanisms, etc. when a social worker seizes a child without a warrant, court order, or judicial authorization under circumstances where there was no evidence that the child was in immediate risk of suffering severe bodily injury in the time it would take to obtain a warrant. First of all, did I read that correctly? Again? Did you read, read that? Yes, along I read with, it. Okay, and did, did I present that to you correctly? Category number two. Twenty-two. Yeah, category In number 20, 22. twenty-two. Yes. What? Okay. Are you able? Are Are you in fact the person most knowledgeable, the person most qualified to testify here today on behalf of your agency as to that category number twenty-two? Um, as far as this specific circumstance, I can say I have never investigated an incident, and nor am I aware of since the time I've been working with the agency, of investigation that um, involved these circumstances. Okay. Let me ask it this way. As the person most knowledgeable testifying on behalf of your agency here today, as the voice of the agency, am I correct that your agency would not discipline one of its workers for seizing a child from the custody of its parents without first obtaining a warrant where there was no evidence the child was in immediate risk of suffering serious bodily injury in the time it would take to get a warrant. Am I correct about that? Um, if the circumstances uh, ray to a violation of policy and procedure, um, a, employee is subject to discipline. Again, um, as far as um, this specifically, I, I, maybe I, I'm, I'm confused on what you want to. I, I'm just saying though, these are the more specific incidents. Mm -hmm. um, as, if employee violate policy procedure based on totality of circumstances, they could be disciplined. Now, um, I know you're saying in this instance you're asking me on six hour and there's no evidence that the child was immediate risk of suffering seriously bodily injury in the time it would take to tame a warrant. I'd have to refer if there's something in policy procedure that's that's specific to this. Okay. Well, in fact, you know for a fact that under the current policies and procedures of your agency, your agency just simply does not get warrants, right? Um I, 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 okay, I, I hate to the, the bounce around, but I am not a DCS specialist, okay? Um, I know and can refer and use my resources to look at policy to determine if that was, um, if there's a policy as it pertains to that, okay? I, I don't want to uh, speak to DCS specialists' training. I'm basically talking about the disciplinary process that well, in order to be able to properly investigate allegations of policy violations, you at least have to have some kind of understanding of what the policies are, right? Correct. Okay. Or be able to refer to them if... Okay. Now, now you reviewed this, this notice of deposition before you came here today, right? Yes. So you knew we were going to be talking to you about disciplinary measures that might apply, for example, if a worker sees the child without getting a warrant, right? Yes. You knew that? Yes. 
Did you do anything, any policy review, anything at all to prepare yourself as the person most knowledgeable to come in here and tell me whether or not a social worker would be dis uh, subject to discipline if they removed a child from the custody of its parents without first getting a warrant under circumstances where there was no evidence that the child was in immediate risk of suffering severe or serious bodily injury in the time that would take to obtain a warrant. Did you do anything to prepare yourself to answer that question? I did not read the procedures through and through to determine if, the proceed, if any policy procedure related to that specific incident. Okay, hold on a second. I appreciate that you didn't read policies or procedures, but my question was actually very, very specific. Okay. I'm going to have her reread the question. I'm going to ask you to listen very carefully to the question, and that's the question I need an answer to. Okay? Okay. okay can I have you reread the question, please? Did you do anything at all to prepare yourself? as a person most knowledgeable to come in here and tell me whether or not a social worker would be subject to discipline if they were moved, if they removed a child from the custody of its parents without first getting a warrant under circumstances where there was no evidence that your child was in immediate risk of suffering severe or serious bodily injury in the time it would take to obtain a warrant. Did you do anything to prepare yourself to answer that question? So that's the question. Did okay. you do anything at all to prepare yourself to answer that specific question? Then the answer would be no. Okay. So I'm correct then that you are not currently sitting here today the person most qualified to address that question that's identified in category number 22, correct? I would say correct. Okay. I'm going to have the same question with respect to categories number actually 23 through 26. And if, we, if you want to take a little break and you can sort of read through those, but I suspect it's going to be the same sort of answer. And I'm trying to streamline things a little bit so okay. we can get through this. So let's take a little break and the witness will read to himself numbers 23 through, I guess, 29 and then we'll come back and, and see what's going on there. Okay, we went off for a while, took a little break, and you had an opportunity to review, I believe it was categories numbered 22 through 29, is that correct? Correct. And did you have an adequate opportunity to go ahead and review those and, and make sure that you understood what was being requested there? Yes. And did you in fact understand what was being requested there? Yes, after reading them. Okay. And to the extent that you had any questions or, you know, misunderstanding of what was being requested there, did you have opportunity to consult with your attorney to clarify? Yes. Okay. And did you, in fact, consult with your attorney to clarify? Yes. Okay. So are you now prepared to let me know whether or not, in fact, you are the person most qualified to testify on behalf of your agency with respect to questions? Well, we've already covered number 21 and 22, but with respect to questions or categories number 23 through 29? Yes. Okay. All right, so with respect to category number 23, the Arizona Department of Economic Security's disciplinary measures, enforcement mechanisms, methods, procedures, and or proceedings when a social worker, employee, and or agent violates, ignores, and or deviates from the Arizona Department of Economic Security's customs, policies, practices, procedures, and or training. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. And you are the person most qualified to testify as to category number 23, correct? Correct. Okay. Are you aware that pursuant to your agency's policies and procedures and training, your workers are required to follow court orders unless the court has either vacated its order, modified its order, or there has been a stay imposed on the order. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. Have you ever investigated a worker who did not adhere to that policy? 
I've looked into allegations as to as what you stated. Okay. How many times have you done that? Um, now I could say like three, four. Did you do that for Miss Karen Wagner? Mm, no. You've never. Have you ever invested Miss Karen uh, Karen Wagner for any type of misconduct or alleged misconduct? Um, no. What about uh, when a social, or rather an investigator, one of your workers, is found by a judge to have not been honest with the court? Is that a violation of policy? Um, oh, dishonesty is a violation of policy, yes. Okay. Have you ever been notified that any particular worker was found, to, found by the court to have been dishonest with the court? I have not investigated. Has anybody in particular? Okay, let's 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 clarify something here. You understand that you are not here in your personal capacity, correct? Well, yes. You are here to testify on behalf of your agency, correct? Correct. So all of my questions for the rest of the day today are not going to re relate to your personal experiences. You understand that? Correct. I'm asking about your agency, and if you don't know. The correct answer is, I don't know, I'm not the right person, and then we'll find somebody else. Are you with me? Yes, I understand okay. what you're saying. Okay, so I'll ask the question again with respect to dishonesty in reporting. Has your agency ever investigated any of its workers for dishonesty in their reports to the court? As it relates to ever, I don't know. Okay. Within the last five years? In the last five years that I can, I can ask you, I don't know that. Okay. So am I correct then, at least as to that um, particular question, whether or not um, the agency has ever disciplined a worker for that particular violation, being dishonest, dishonesty in reporting, you are not the correct person to be testifying as to that issue? Um, I say I'm the correct person, mm -hmm. and I'm, and you you're know, just not prepared answer, today to answer that particular ever if well, they've ever investigated within the last five years. Let's make it a limited. Window. Okay. Um, the databases we have um, aren't specific enough to like dishonesty and go to a particular case. How is the database set up? Let's get, see if I can't get at least a rudimentary understanding of how it is you guys track the data. So we have a database and it presumably has some fields in it, right? Correct. And one of the fields would be the particular worker's name, for example? Correct. Another field would be the nature of the allegation? Uh, there would be a field in that, yes. Okay, and it would one be, of them would be yes, the okay. nature of the allegation. And then I presume there would be a field for the date that the allegation was made. Yes. Okay. And then I presume there would also be a field for um, the investigator, perhaps that was assigned to investigate the allegation. Correct. Then I also presume there would be a field for the date upon which the investigation was complete. Yes. Then would there also be a field? regarding the proposed disposition of the allegation? Um, I believe the field, yes, there is a recommendation if, um, in the database I'm referring to. Okay. So going back, are there any other fields in the database that you recall that we haven't already identified? Um, there would be a final disposition. Okay, and the final disposition, just so that I make sure I understand, that would be telling us what was done by management with respect to the recommendation? Um, yes, it would be the final disposition of final. Di uh, okay. okay, going back, are there, are there I'm any? I'm sorry, the final what? Form of discipline. Okay. Are there any other fields that we haven't identified yet? Well, there, there's other things in there they request, like the region the worker's from, um, the grade, the pay, 
uh, covered or uncovered. What does that mean, covered or uncovered? Um, a covered employee basically has, in a sense, more employee rights when it comes to the due process if they're getting discipline. Okay. And then covered or uncovered, any other fields? No, I believe that. Okay. And when we're talking about an employee's due process rights when they're potentially subject to discipline, what do you mean by that? Um, a covered employee, depending on the discipline, has a right to appeal up to the personnel board. An uncovered employee basically has no appeal rights. Okay. It's a right to work. Okay, I, I got gotcha. you. So when we're talking about the due process for the employees who may be subject to discipline, that due process right, does that include the right to uh, notice of what the basis is for the recommended discipline? Um, depending on the form of discipline, yes. Does it also, that due process concept, also include the employee's right to be heard by some decision-making body regarding the prospective discipline to be meted out? Yes. And is that right to be heard, is that the right to be heard prior to the meeting out of discipline or subsequent to the meeting out of discipline? Um, if a covered employee is going to be terminated, mm -hmm. they get what they call a notice of charges, which is prior to the termination, mm -hmm. which they get to review and respond to. Mm -hmm. um, and then a decision is made whether to um, accept their response and not terminate or mm -hmm. Okay. Your response is not sufficient, and they go ahead with termination. Okay, so they essentially get some form of hearing where they can air their side of the story before the discipline is effectuated. Depending on the form of discipline, yes. Okay, well, when it's termination. When termination, it's yes, they will get an opportunity to, to respond to the notice of charges. Okay, and that happens before the termination? Correct. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not that is called pre-deprivation due process? That not never heard, heard that, that term. Word. What about as a police officer in your training with post or anywhere else? Did you ever hear that term pre deprivation due process? Okay. Going back to the fields that are in this database, when we're talking about the nature of the allegations, the field that, that contains the substance of the nature of the allegations, what is it we're putting in there? Um, it, it would be basically a brief summary of the allegation. So in order to determine whether or not, for example, your agency has ever disciplined or investigated a worker who's been accused of being dishonest with a court, you would have to go through and actually review the brief summary of each of those allegations? Um, yes, and, and let me expound that. The database we're currently using, mm -hmm. we re I believe only started in 2015, which is when I came into the, or shortly after when I came into the employment. Um, I cannot speak of how they used prior to 2015. You'd said um, you believe that database only started in 2015, which is when you came on and came into the employment of the agency and that you cannot speak to what they used prior to 2015, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you know whether or not the agency did in fact maintain a database prior to 2015 relative to these employee discipline issues? Okay. Um, I cannot say that other than uh, maybe, maybe a brief history might be in order. Okay. I, I, you probably already know. No, I actually don't know anything about your discipline stuff. Okay. So educate um, me. It's not so much discipline. The agency was part of Department of Economic Security prior to 2014, and it split up. Um, what I have seen and um, I guess can attest to is what the procedures and what records we have after that point. Okay. So, I mean, D DES, D Department of Child Safety split off from DES, which I'm sure you're aware of. Yeah, I was okay. aware of that. Okay, right. and um, I can speak for DCS, how DES ran their investigations and things like that, that I can't attest to. Okay. 
who would be the person most qualified to testify about how disciplinary enforcement, the mechanisms, methods, those things, how that all happened before 2015 when you came on board? I mean, second to think, there's been a lot of turnover, people retiring and moving on. Sure. Um, I cannot give you a name, to be honest okay. with you, as far as who handled and wore those prior to when I came on, okay. or prior to the separation of DES and DCS. Okay, that's fine. Do you know whether or not the similar data, these fields that you've already described to me that are in the current database, do you know whether or not there was some other method of tracking that data before you came on in 2015? I, no, I do not know what they used prior to my coming on. So today, if you're called upon to investigate allegations against an employee today, part of that process would be to look at their past disciplinary history, correct? Correct. How do you do that if you don't have it? Okay, let me correct myself. Okay. There is one um, that I'm aware of, file, um, that has a, um, trying to think, it might even go back to 2006, and it goes yearly, so 2006, seven and so forth and so on. Um, if, to check if an employee had prior formal discipline, mm -hmm. I would refer to those files, okay. okay? Which I can search by name, mm -hmm. um, but as far as a key word, um, I have not known it to work that way. I okay. have always had to go by name to look in okay. if there's previous formal discipline. And on average, um, how many workers per year are subjected to some form of formal discipline such that they would appear in that file? Um, again, this is an estimate because I don't have sure. to count. There, there could be as many as... 30, 40, up to 50. Again, it's an estimate, not an accurate sure. depiction of each year. How many employees does DCS have? Um, a total number. Um, yeah. I, I, can, I can right now tell you as of April 17th, there is um, I believe a little over 1,100 DCS specialists. Okay. And do you have a breakdown of those 1,100 specialists? Do you have a breakdown as to what type of specialist they are? Like, are they an investigative specialist, a um, adoption specialist, or? Um, the, the breakdown that I saw was specialists. It just didn't determine investigations, ongoing adoptions, so forth and so on. It was specialists. Okay, so that's just all you have immediately accessible is the total? Yes. Okay. Okay, if we look at category number 26, it reads the number of and identification of the social workers employed by the Arizona Department of Economic <coughs> Security between January 1st, 2010 through the present whose job duties included investigating child abuse allegations. First, did I read that correctly? Yeah, that's what category okay. says. Okay. What efforts, if any, did you undertake to make yourself knowledgeable so that you could respond to that particular request? Um, I spoke with, um, I may not have his title correctly, as a program coordinator. Okay, that might not be his exact title. His name is Jeffrey Potter. Potter? Potter, P-O-T-T-E-R. And he keeps the databases as, in fact, where I got the approximate number of DCS specialists. He mm -hmm. has, um, he's the numbers guy. Okay. He'd be able to, he has all the, the charts and the numbers. Um, I did ask him if 
as far as what he had available to him now, mm -hmm. um, he is unsure if he could give an accurate number or even get the numbers for Category 26. Can you give us an estimate? I'd have to ask him if, if he could give an estimate. Okay, because so. Because he basically, yeah, when I asked him, he, uh, um, he couldn't give a number. He's, he seemed to be, might be difficult to obtain that. In what within his knowledge and what he has currently do you guys even keep track of the number of investigative workers that you employ um, I know we, we keep track of investigative specialists and mm -hmm. DCS specialists that's an overall title now sure. um, as far as being broken down to investigations uh, adoptions and you have to understand that even though your adoptions you could end up investigating so it, it's in a sense it's like um, short answer right now I cannot tell you as far as it breaks down to those numbers as far as investigations adoptions um, so forth right. and the other just to back up a little bit I understand that you know in the different units the workers may be called upon to investigate allegations that arise in the context of like ongoing case management or adoptions, that sort of thing. But in fact, your agency, the way it's broken down is there is an investigations unit and their primary responsibility is to take referrals from the hotline, go out and investigate those referrals, correct? Correct. How many workers do you have in that particular unit? I can't give you an answer right now. Okay. Could somebody else give me an answer to that question? Um, that is possibly someone else could give you that. Would that be that uh, Mr. Potter? He might have that answer. I can't speak for him on, based on his database. Okay, but here today you are not the person most knowledgeable, most qualified to testify as to category number two. 26 on behalf of your agency is that correct um, as far as those numbers go no no it's not correct no or? as far as okay am I, I I can get the information to be knowledgeable off as far as um, but it's just not today not today I can't give you an answer okay on that today okay so another time perhaps we can get back together and you maybe can give me that answer um, no of course through mr. sure Bowden, if that's possible Sure. It's just you're not equipped today to, to answer that category. Yes. Okay. Um, number 27, is the same true of number 27? That is the number of an identification of workers employed by the department or Arizona Department of Economic Security between January 1st, 2010 through the present, whose job duties included removing children from their parents' custody? Would that be the same answer you um, can give me a number today? Based on this question, you know, all DCS specialists mm -hmm. um, basically have those responsibilities and it could include in their job description to do that. Oh, to remove children? If they go through the proper procedures. Okay. So with respect to category number 27, the answer to that question would be 1,100 roughly, correct? Correct. So let me make sure I'm clear on this. There are 1,100 agency employees, these, these government agents out there who, at least according to your agency, have the power and authority to remove children from the custody of their parents, correct? Um, yes, assume they go through okay. proper procedures. Am I correct that your agency does not enforce through disciplinary measures constitutional warrant requirements? Um, There's, what I can say, there's no specific policy that addresses, um, nor is there a policy that I'm aware of or have investigated or seen that addresses specifically the constitutional, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, using the warrant to remove the child. Okay. So just to clarify and make sure I'm understanding you is that as far as 
you know and your concern testifying here today on behalf of the agency as its person most knowledgeable with respect to enforcement and discipline. There is no policy that would require one of those 1,100 people to obtain a warrant under any, any set of circumstances before removing a child from the custody of its parents. Am I understanding you correctly? Yes, there's no specific policy okay. as to. Okay. And so it would follow then, and correct me if I'm wrong, that your agency has never disciplined a worker, one of those 1,100 people over time, maybe more, for failing to obtain a warrant to remove a child from the custody of its parents under any circumstance, whether there was an emergency or not. Um, You've never disciplined anybody for that. For, I would, okay, no. For that specific, because there's no, like I said, specific policy that addresses that. Mm -hmm. And because there's no specific policy that addresses warrant requirements, your agency's never disciplined a worker for failing to adhere to warrant requirements, right? Yes. Okay. And in fact, if it were shown that a worker did in fact fail to adhere to warrant requirements, your agency still would not discipline that worker because there's no policy that actually requires the worker to adhere to warrant requirements. Is that correct? Um, no, employee would not be disciplined for violating a policy that it's specific to that issue because, because the policy, there isn't one. Right. So my question then is, and, and all I'm looking for is a yes, you're correct or no, you're wrong answer. Am I correct that your agency, if it were shown that one of your workers violated warrant requirements in removing a child, your agency still would not discipline that worker because there's no policy that the worker violated? Am I correct? Yes. Okay. So am I also correct that there is no specific policy that would give rise to discipline if it were shown in a general sense that one of your workers violated a parent or child's constitutional rights? Um. Correct. There's no, if there's, there's no policy specific to that, they, can, they would not be disciplined for violating a policy. Okay. Now, I think you told me this a little bit earlier, a worker could be disciplined for failing or refusing to violate a court order, correct? Yes. Okay. You just don't know whether or not that's ever happened within your agency. That is, a, a worker has, you don't know whether or not a worker has been disciplined in the past for violating a court order? Um, no, right now I can't say that. Okay. Um, what steps would you have to take to enable yourself to answer that question? Um, again, I would have to look through okay. the files that are available to me to see if there's discipline and related to um, uh, that violation. Okay. Okay. And you haven't done that in preparing to testify today? No, I have not looked at all of them. Do you know, is there a policy, whether it's written or unwritten, is there a policy that actually permits your workers to violate certain constitutional rights? I'm not aware of any policy that specifically allows whether written or unwritten. Do you understand? Only written. Yeah, I don't know about any unwritten okay. policies. I don't know about written policies. And but you understand that policies can be both written and unwritten, right? Um, I can speak as far as, far as the Arizona Department of Child Safety. We do not discipline for any unwritten type policy or okay. procedure. Okay, so if it's not specifically in writing in the policy manual, a worker will not be subject to discipline. Yes, no, they will not be subject, I should okay. say. Do you know whether or not your um, agency's workers have to take an oath when they're hired on? Um, 
I'm trying to remember when I was hired out, <laughs> actually. But um, there are certain documents you write um, uh, that employment handbook, um, certain about driving. Um, Let me ask this. Maybe it'll make it simpler. I don't. Okay. I'm Ooh, sorry. Go ahead. You were hired on. Uh, I don't remember how many years ago it was. Was it like five or six years? Almost three years. Three right? years, that's yeah. right. You were hired on about three years ago. When you were hired on, did you have to take an oath? To be honest with you, I don't remember. Okay. When you first started as a police officer, you took an oath, oh, right? Yes. Do you remember what that oath was? Parts of it, yes. Do you remember the part about faithfully protecting and defending the United States Constitution? Yes. And you took that seriously then as a police officer, right? Yes. And that was important to you, right? Yes. Did you, did you keep a copy of your oath? Um, I believe I did. It's stored somewhere. Okay. Uh, for at least a period of time, did you have it in a frame? No. No? Okay. But that oath was important to you, right? Yes. And it's still important to you, right? Uh, to me, yes. Okay. Did you have to take a similar, similar oath when you joined DCS? That is something that at least included the phrase, faithfully protect and defend the United States Constitution. Um, right now, I don't remember taking an oath of that. Okay. What about the Arizona Constitution? Do you remember at least taking an oath to faithfully protect and defend the Arizona Constitution? Do you ask you, I don't remember taking one. You don't remember taking an oath at all when you signed on with this? It's right now, no. Okay. Do you recall, uh, do you recall ever working on putting together a project of some sort with Deborah Harper? Actually developing a protocol? Um, this was when, a, when I was a police officer involved in that okay. um, Why don't you tell investigation of, as far as the law enforcement protocol, not the entire, just the law enforcement part. Well, wasn't it uh, titled Multidisciplinary Protocol for the Investigation of Child Abuse? Yes. And it was developed by the Interagency Council? Yes. Maricopa County Children's Justice Project? Yes. The last revision was in August 2008? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you participate in that revision? Um, yes, I did. Okay. In the have, law enforcement section. Have there been any other revisions that you know of since 2008, August? Um, Um, uh, there might have been, I bet off the top of my head, I don't recall one. There, there were several revisions over the years. Okay. And in the context of putting together that protocol, did you undertake an effort to familiarize yourself with the rules of law that applied to the work that you're writing this protocol for? The protocol was, um, again, the law enforcement section of the protocol was uh, set up to make the investigations standardized and make sure everything was done accordingly um, in order to get a ses successful prosecution of the charge. Now, it's my recollection as police officers, we would be aware of that, but the protocol was more so um, responding, interviewing the child, um, evidence, packaging the, uh, um, the case for prosecution. Um, Again, this has been a while, don't recall discussing in that the constitutionality of certain things. Of course, as a police officer, you have to be aware mm -hmm. 
you know, of the things as far as warrants and things like that, the procedure to get them and follow them. In the context of putting together this protocol with together with Ms. Harper, did you in fact include any discussion about warrant requirements? Um, oh no. Are you, are you sure about that? Well, you can understand when we did this protocol, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people involved. Okay. Uh, Ms. Harper would have taken care of the DCA or the Child Protective Services protocol. Uh, there's protocol for schools, protocols for counselors. So when we worked with our protocol, the law enforcement section, um, we dealt mainly with the police officers in, the, in that. in the developing the law enforcement protocol. Okay, and was it possible, according to your protocol, is it possible for law enforcement to request or order a forensic medical evaluation of a child? Yes. Okay. In order to order that or request that forensic medical examination of a child, at least for law enforcement, were you required to first obtain a warrant or the parent's consent? No. You just do that on your own? Yeah, I've never, never got, got, a, a got a warrant in order to do a forensic exam. Okay. Have you ever heard of a case called Wallace versus Spencer? Have you ever heard of a case called May versus County of San Bernardino? No. Have you ever heard of a case called Rogers versus County of San Joaquin? No. Have you ever heard of a case called Ram versus Rubin? No. Have you ever heard of a case called Calabretta v. Floyd? No. Have you ever heard of a case called Humphreys versus County of Los Angeles? No. Have you ever heard of a case called Marshall versus County of San Diego? No. Have you ever heard of a case called R.C. versus County of Los Angeles? No. Okay. Have you ever heard of any case, any court case at all, Ninth Circuit, U.S. Supreme Court, anything at all, that requires police to get a warrant before doing a forensic medical evaluation of a child in the absence of an exigency? No. And that is in your entire time as an employee of either the police department over in, wherever that was, where was that? Glendale? Glendale. Glendale? Or during your tenure as an employee with DCS? Never heard such a thing? No. No, you've never heard such a thing? No, I've never heard such a thing, nor have I ever been required to, okay. as far as, as the police officer, required to get a warrant to can, uh, have a forensic exam done on a child. What about a school interview? Have you ever uh, heard that in order to interview a child at school without the parent's knowledge or consent and in the absent of, absence of exigent circumstances, as a police officer, you would be required to get a warrant before talking to that child? Um, toward the end of my police career, mm -hmm. it, it was brought up about uh, speaking to involving the parent, but never a warrant. So the concept would have been that you would need to, you know, get consent of the parent to interview the child? Is yes, that right? depending, of course, there's certain right. circumstances, but. Do you know whether or not that was in response to a case called Calabretta v. Floyd? Um, that I don't know. Okay. Let me ask you, would it be a violation of policy for your agency that would subject a worker to discipline if the worker seized a child from the custody of its parents when there was no evidence that the child was in, and this is key, immediate risk of suffering severe bodily injury? I can say there's, there's no policy specific to that. Um, I, I, you know, as far as removing a child without, um, um, as you said. I can or can't say. I can't say, nor have I seen one. 
can't, cannot. Cannot, correct. So am I correct then that your agency would not discipline a worker for seizing a child from the custody of its parents under circumstances where there was no evidence that the child was in immediate risk of suffering severe bodily injury. Am I correct in that? Um, as far as no policy relates specifically to that, no, they would not be disciplined. Okay. Uh, one thing going back to that interdisciplinary protocol that we were talking about just a moment ago, the one that you participated in putting together, you recall that? Yes. You had said something along the lines of the protocol was designed for getting successful prosecutions. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. What did you mean by that? It was designed for getting successful prosecutions. Well, as far as um, making sure all the um, the procedures are followed as far as making sure um, you know children are interviewed by a forensic interviewer children are getting forensic exams if necessary um, as far as um, interviewing all the parties involved in this um, um, you know checking on the background of the suspects all this stuff would be necessary to prosecute a case so it was set up so certain, one is standardized and two certain steps aren't missed that could um, make a prosecution difficult. Mm -hmm. Like for example, you're familiar with this concept of disclosing exculpatory evidence, right? Um, I know what a term you mean, yes. Okay, well I mean as part of your police training. Yes, I, I know what you're saying. As part of your police training as an investigator, you were trained that you had an affirmative obligation and duty to disclose exculpatory evidence, right? Yes. Okay. And in putting together this protocol, that same duty still applied, right? Yes. Okay. Now that you're with DCS, would it subject a worker to discipline if they failed to disclose exculpatory evidence in favor of a parent in one of these uh, juvenile court cases, according to policy. Okay. Let me use a second to. Um, during investigation, if I found or any investigator found there was an in particularly an intentional act um, um, to withhold, modify um, information um, that employee could be subject to discipline based on, on policies. Okay. Speaking on behalf of the agency, has your agency ever disciplined a worker for failing to disclose exculpatory evidence to the juvenile court? Again, I'm trying to think through the cases, what I viewed. Um, And I know you don't like the word is I am not aware, nor, and by saying I am not aware, I'm not familiar with other investigators or as the agency discipline for that specific issue. Okay. So as you're sitting here today, you don't know of any worker that has ever been disciplined by your agency for failing to disclose known exculpatory evidence to the juvenile court. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. 
That's what I'm saying, yes. Okay. Can I clarify? Depends on what you want to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you stated that, you know, ever disciplined. Mm -hmm. um, nor am I aware of an allegation being made as to that. You've never heard of a parent or one of the agency's clients ever complaining that um, a worker may have been dishonest in their reporting to the court? You've never heard even an inkling of that? Um, I have heard that, yes. Yes, you've okay. heard that. You've also heard maybe an inkling of a parent complaining that a worker, in fact, failed to disclose known exculpatory evidence to the court as well, right? Um, I would say yes, they have. Right. I've heard that. Right. And, in fact, that's something that, I mean, there's newspaper articles about it, right? Um, You've read it. Yeah, I I've, I've read the paper in the news. Yeah. Over the years, even before I worked there, I've read stuff. Right, and you see those types of allegations or articles about those types of allegations coming up in the newspapers frequently, right? Um, frequently is objective, but I've, I've, I've read articles where those allegations have been made. It, it, hap it happens frequently enough that it comes to mind when you're thinking of it, right? Yes, based in okay. not only as a HR function. So you have in fact heard from some source that parents are complaining in some sense about social worker dishonesty in their court reporting, whether it be by um, you know, just fabricating information or omitting material exculpatory information, right? Um, over the years, allegations, mm -hmm. whether I investigate them or Mm -hmm. Heard things. So you, yes, you have. Yes, heard yes, I have heard. Okay. Your agency, though, has never investigated to ascertain whether or not those allegations were in fact true. Correct. Um, trying to be strict allegations um, investigated uh, again I'm trying to think of cases I've done and cases other people have done um, Allega I'll say allegations have been investigated as allegations as to whether the uh, the worker was um, either honest or completed her his or her uh, duties. That, that, that sounds unclear. <laughs> that isn't Make sure they follow policy and procedure in their investigation of the. Let me just try the question again. Okay. Can I go back up? Am I correct that your agency, though, has never investigated the allegations that its workers were either dishonest in their court reporting or failed to disclose known exculpatory evidence to the court in their court reporting? Am I correct about that? It's kind of a yes or no question. Yeah, I know it's a yes or no question. I also want to make sure that I give you an accurate answer okay. as far as ever and never is sort of a mm -hmm. wide range. Mm -hmm. um, and 
as far as investigating, there are occasions where HR doesn't investigate, but discipline, depending on the situation, could be handled at the field level. Okay. So that, that sounds a little bit like you're speculating. Well, I, I'm not. Do you know of that? Do I know the fact happening? that that happened? No. Okay, so okay. let's go back because I don't want you to speculate. Okay, what, I understand. What I, <laughs> I don't want you to speculate or guess about it, about it, you know what somebody's doing at a field level or wherever. What I want to know is whether or not you know whether it happened. Okay? So no guessing, no speculating, no no thinking about what you know in some nebulous world may or may not happen. Can I go back up and have that or the question before the colloquy reread? Yes. Am I correct that your agency, though, has never investigated the allegation that its workers were either dishonest in their court reporting or failed to disclose known exculpatory evidence to the court in their court reporting? Am I correct about that? Then, Sean, I'm going to object to foundation. Sure. I'll join. I... Sure. Go ahead. 